Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and welcome to chapter two. This is all about atoms, molecules, and the chemical basis of life. So here, you'll be learning about how those elements, meaning only these elements, are what began our universe. And it all began with what was called hydrogen and helium. So since that Big Bang, all of those naturally occurring heavier elements have formed through processes occurring in stars, and that's what you see being depicted in your textbook on page 26. So here we'll consider how, how these properties of those elements serve as that fundamental underpinning for the ways in which the structure and function work together in organisms, and how these properties enable organisms to store and use both information and energy. Hence, the knowledge of chemistry is essential for the understanding of how organisms are, and even their function. So it's these chemical similarities among all organisms on Earth that provide strong evidence for the evolution of all organisms, from the common ancestor all the way down to, of course, those that are not so common. And this is how biologists explain what we learn from studying bacteria or rats in labs that can be applied to other organisms, including us. So having said it in that way, it's that basic chemical and physical properties that govern organisms, and they're not unique to living things because they also apply to those non-living systems. So let us begin here, and we'll begin together with contrasting inorganic and organic compounds. So when I compare those two, I like to think of those inorganic compounds to include things such as salts, acids, bases, and water. And when we get to those that are called organic compounds, these are going to be those huge molecules, those colossal molecules containing lots and lots of carbon. So from here, we'll move ourselves on over and get to where we begin formally with what is known as the element. So I'll just describe the element class as a substance that can be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical reactions. So, as that's been stated, each element has a chemical symbol, and it's usually the first letter or the first and second letter of it, such as that C for carbon, or that O for oxygen, or the Na for sodium. And I'm confident you've heard of these before, but that's pretty much what it is. And I could go on and on with those things, such as that Ca for calcium, or even the N for nitrogen, or the F for fluorine, or even Mg for magnesium. So all of these things are integrally important to life here on Earth. And these are things that I would say you should know in order to, of course, do well, not just in this class being a biology course, but I would say even other classes that are to come. So as we continue here now, I'll nextly get on into the atom. So... I say the atom is that smallest portion of an element that retains its chemical properties. So with that, atoms are composed of even smaller parts, and we call those those subatomic particles. So those subatomic particles are known as the proton, neutron, and electron. So having gotten to this point, I guess I'll just continue on with where we are to ensure it makes sense. And as I do continue on, what I'm saying here is, by way of those protons, neutrons, and exons, it's protons that carry that positive charge. I'll repeat, protons carry a positive charge. The neutrons, they are neutral, and electrons carry a negative charge. So the protons with that positive charge are equal to the atomic number. With that, neutrons, which are neutral, are calculated by taking the atomic mass and subtracting the atomic number from the atomic mass. And then finally, the number of electrons for some atom is determined by the atomic number as well. So having gotten to that, just keep in mind that mass, of course, has mass and takes up space. 
So having gotten to this, just keep in mind that in your lab manual, as soon as you open up that front cover, there is a wonderful picture of that periodic table of elements. And we'll get more to that a bit later. But for the sake of time, we'll continue on. So the atom class, by and large, is identified by its number of protons. So as you see it here, hydrogen, of course, has an atomic number that is one. And if the atomic number is one, of course, it has one proton. And the same class could be stated about carbon with six protons and the atomic number being six. I'll continue on from here to ensure we get to where we're going next. So now to, I've already gotten to the atomic mass unit, so I'm gonna continue on getting to isotopes. So having gotten to here, class, keep in mind that with isotopes of the same element, they have the same number of protons and electrons. However, the number of neutrons varies. So keep that in mind because isotopes are infinitely important. I would say not just for the sake of the lecture, but they're essentially important class when you get down to medicine. So they can be used in medicine, not just as far as treatment, but they can also be used as a tracer, meaning to trace something throughout an experiment or even to trace something class throughout the body. So they use these to detect things. And of course, they can be used in cancer as well. So I won't do a lot with electron orbitals, but this is just the way in which those electrons move. And of course, they are high energy molecules and they're moving throughout. So having gotten to this, what I'll get to now is going to be the valence shell. So as I get to the valence shell, what I'll say about this is valence shells are important in chemical reactions. It's going to be those valence shell electrons that I would say are going to be that determinant of whether or not that, of course, element reacts with this element and the way in which those chemical bonds occur. And since I've mentioned the word chemical bonds, it says it right here. It's all about those valence electrons. So what's in that outermost shell? So please keep that in mind. And with that, the first valence shell holds two electrons. That first valence shell holds two electrons. And I almost forgot, so I should make sure I state this. Please make sure you're in your textbook. So if you go to your textbook, you'll see this information class being presented to you on page 30 of your textbook. I repeat, page 30 of the textbook. So once you get there, you'll see what I'm referring to about valence electron shells. So to pick up where I left off, I'll now get back to it. So valence electron shells, as I mentioned, this is what happens by way of those chemical reactions and chemical bonding. So as it happens, it says that atom tends to lose gain or even share electrons. So with what I'm getting to here is, as this occurs, I'll get to the octet rule. So with that octet rule, it's meaning that these atoms strive to fill the valence shell. I'll repeat, the atoms, they strive to fill the valence shell. And when I get to this, it's all because of those orbitals need to be full in order for, of course, chemical bonding to occur. So from here, just make sure you know that the first shell holds a maximum of two electrons. And since it holds a maximum of two electrons, that means that that valence shell is full when there are two electrons. So if you were to look at hydrogen having one, I repeat, if you look at hydrogen having one electron, would you state that that valence electron shell is full? I would hope you would say no. So how many valence electrons are needed to fill that electron shell? I would hope you would say one more valence electron is needed to fill that electron shell. 
So having stated it that way, this is what I'm referring to, to ensure that you know. So with that, valence electrons are the way in which bonding occurs. I mentioned it already. So the first shell holds two electrons, and the second shell holds eight electrons. And as far as this class is concerned, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And as you all get into, of course, a chemistry class, I would think that you would go a lot farther than that first shell. And I guess I'll go as far as the third shell. And I'll say the third shell also holds eight electrons. So please keep this in mind for chemical bonding. So next. Chemical formulas. So the chemical formula is that shorthand way of writing out of course, what is in the composition of that substance. So it could be that you have it written as being NH2 or even NH3 or N2H4 as far as being that molecular formula or even by way of that structural formula as you see that H2 and the O for water. So it's done by this to ensure that you can quickly look and see just what is that chemical composition of the substance. So as far as chemical reactions are concerned, once I've now got this, this just shows you what's going on to, of course, get from reactants that are going to be here on the left to products that are there on the right. So the reactants that are here yield the products that are there. So if you look closely, I'll take my time here. On the left-hand side, we have reactants. And if it's not quite obvious there, it tells you up above. Reactants here are glucose and oxygen. By way of glucose and oxygen, they yield products as follows. Products here are, well, I'll ask you, what are the products? In this case, the products that have been yielded are CO2, water, and of course, energy has been liberated. So what you're looking at is, your, it will come up later in another chapter, but this is an amazing way to see it as far as having a basis. So reactants shall always yield products. So now on to chemical equations. <clears throat> so it's many times in the body, especially, it's when those reactions can proceed in either direction. And they can do this thing, I would say, simultaneously. So to keep you and I alive, what we're seeing here is the way in which carbonic acid is formed. And this brings me to, I guess I see a background with knowing how the human body works. So in the human body, it's, it's called a buffer system. And that buffer system is what keeps us, it says at equilibrium, but I'll now call it homeostasis. <laughs> Excuse me. It allows us to ensure that Everything within you and everything within me is kept within those narrow limits. So the way it happens is by, of course, our hypothalamus sensing, detecting those changes by way of those receptors. So we have those receptors known as nerve cells that detect those changes. And by way of these chemical reactions, they can proceed either from this left to right direction or from that right to left direction. So what you're seeing here, of course, is from left to right being CO2, water, and of course, going from left to right to yield carbonic acid. So it does indeed depend on what's happening within the body to, of course, need to proceed from that left to right direction. And the same can be said to, of course, proceed from the right to left with carbonic acid, yielding, of course, carbon dioxide and water. So it's by way of chemical bonds meaning it's chemical bonding that provides the way in which those, those atoms are held together. So that bond energy is necessary to break that chemical bond, and this is especially the case in the, in, in the case of ionic bonding and the covalent bond. Let's begin now with the covalent bond. So I, I love to say that the covalent bond is that strongest bond. So in a way to describe it, I'll say, in covalent bonding, it involves the sharing of electrons between atoms. So the valence shell is full. 
So I gave the question earlier, I said, all right, we have hydrogen here. So I asked, how many valence shell electrons does hydrogen have? And I think the answer from you was one. So of course, by bonding two hydrogen atoms together, we do indeed get hydrogen gas created by, of course, that sharing of those two electrons to fill the valence shell. And of course, there you have it. Next of which is methane gas. I don't know if you have a periodic table nearby. If you don't, I say, please press pause now to get one. So we have carbon here. And since we have carbon here, if you were to look at that periodic table I told you to grab, and you can also just grab your lab manual, it's there in the front cover, look closely there. So we have hydrogen, there's a one above it. We have beryllium, there's a two above it. Those two numbers give you the number of valence shell electrons. I'll continue. The next, I want to jump over and go to boron. So it has three valence shell electrons. Carbon has four valence shell electrons. Nitrogen has five valence shell electrons. Oxygen has six valence shell electrons. Fluorine has seven valence shell electrons. And helium and the rest of those in blue in your lab manual have eight valence shell electrons and they are known as those noble gases. So you need that periodic table out for what I just did. So looking at carbon class in this example to of course bond together with hydrogen to make methane gas, I mentioned earlier it has one, two, three, four valence electrons. So I hope you now know that four plus four equals eight. And that is why class we have methane gas by way of those covalent bonds from each of those individual hydrogen atoms. So this shows the very same. In this case, it's showing you by way of water being formed from that oxygen that has six valence shell electrons, and of course, those two hydrogens, each of which having one valence shell electron. So of course, I hope you now get it. Six plus two equals eight. Water is indeed a covalent molecule. So this is where I just came from class with methane, methane gas being CH4. So typical of which for me to illustrate this class will be like this that I'm showing you. That's the way I typically draw this out on the board to make sure that you see those lines in indicating those covalent bonds as it, as it occurs. And I said there's nothing wrong with the Lewis dot structure, nothing wrong with it. I just, I just don't typically illustrate mine that way. So those covalent bonds class, as they are, they can be that single, the double, or even that triple bond. And that does indeed class indicate the pairing of those electrons to, of course, yield or at least provide that bond. So with that, that's why you see the single covalent bond class with, of course, the hydrogen. The hydrogen. And of course, if you look closely, we have those two oxygen atoms because they have two pairs. I repeat, those two pairs. So the form of that double covalent bond. And that's why you see those two parallel lines drawn there. So with electronegativity, it just measures the attraction class of the shared electrons. So it could be a non-polar covalent bond, meaning as they bond together, they have similar electronegativities class with equally shared electrons. Or it could very well be class that polar covalent bond that exists. And with this, it's between those atoms because of the difference class in electronegativity. Let's get to a, a quick example that shows you. So if you look here, class, this is what I've shown you just moments ago. This is water. This is H2O. And as you look here, it does look a bit different. So give me just a moment here. So we have H. We have H, polar covalent, let's begin. I want to keep drawing here because I just need to make sure you can tell. So as I've done this class, those oxygens, and I said those because typical of which for me is to draw more than just one water molecule. Typical is to draw more than one water molecule. So that what you're seeing here is that this is a polar covalent molecule because they have those 
different poles or the dissimilar poles. So the hydrogens class carry that, that partial positive charge as opposed to, of course, the negatively charged oxygen. Hence, water is known as a polar covalent molecule. And I guess I can draw another for you here to not take up too much time in this lecture. So there you go. So looking at it that way, this is the very same I drew at the top right, just showing you this being, of course, the sharing of electrons from that hydrogen, from that hydrogen, and of course those two plus the six class provide, of course, that eight, where we want to be classed with covalent bonds, and of course the filling class of that valence shell electron. So now we've moved on to class two, an ion. But keep in mind, class, that ions are carrying a charge. They are electrically charged particles. And it could very well be classed on as a cation or an anion. So think, class, of that cation as being an electron class that has been lost. And as you have lost that electron, which carries a negative charge, it causes that, of course, atom class to become positively charged. Cat, think of the T. Positive charge, cation. <laughs> Excuse me. Whereas the anion is going to, of course, occur and form when you have the gain class of a valence electron. And by gaining that negative charge, it then class becomes negatively charged. So anions are negatively charged as opposed to cations, which are positively charged. So with that bit of information being given class, just keep in mind that those charges class provide the basis of the transformation of energy class within the cell, as well as the transmission class of nerve impulses. That's major. As well as class, it's that basis of muscle contraction as you all maybe sit, as you stand, as you lay and listen to this lecture and take notes. It's this, meaning ions are what I would say make the body move. And, and you're saying, what do you mean? Well, your, your muscles class could not contract unless class it was first. The movement of those sodium ions class into that nerve cell to depolarize that nerve cell and then lead to, of course, contraction thereafter at that neuromuscular junction. So without calcium ions class, contraction would never occur, which, of course, was all based on the, of course, ion itself. Now to the ionic bond. So ionic bonding class occurs we have a bond class between the positive charge of a cation and the negative charge class of an anion. So with that being stated class, it's that ionic compound that consists of both, of course, anions and cations bonded by the opposite charge. So when that's defined in such a way class, let's get to our example. In this example, we'll get to sodium, which will react with chloride and it's all because of sodium's single valence electron being transferred class to chlorine. And let's get there now. So as this happens, class, meaning in, in I guess I'll say, with ionic bonds, I'll put it this way. They're strong. I repeat, ionic bonds are strong when they're dry. Ionic bonds are strong when they're dry. And then they're weak when wet. So let's get to the example. So you have sodium, and I mentioned sodium because it's, it's pretty important. I don't know that you all have your periodic table nearby, so let me just draw it up really quickly. So here is sodium, and I'll just say sodium with one valence electron, and here is chlorine. And chlorine class is found on the right-hand side of the periodic table, and it's right next to the noble gases. So here is one, here is two, here is three, here is four, five, six, Seven. So looking at this, I hope it's now pretty obvious, class, that it's a lot easier to gain an electron 
than it is class for sodium to, of course, gain seven electrons. So what happens here, class, is that one valence electron from sodium is transferred over to chlorine, and what is formed, class, is sodium chloride, which is why, class, you see the indicated charge. Sodium chloride. So in water, class, dissociation occurs. I repeat, in water, dissociation occurs into those individual ions. Hence, you now see, class, we have sodium being now in a plus, and chlorine being Cl negative. Sodium class lost, I repeat, sodium class lost an electron, and by losing that electron class, I repeat, by losing an electron, it now carries a positive charge, and by chlorine gaining that electron class, it is now negatively charged. Keep that in mind, class, because you will see this throughout your, your I guess I'll say, biological career. <laughs> So water class is an amazing solvent, and if you want to know how amazing, I would like to say the most amazing. It's the universal one. So it's capable class of dissolving, and what it dissolves class is it dissolves solutes. So solutes are dissolved class within some solvent, and it's because of course the polarity. So water molecules easily dissolve class polar or ionic substances. This is why I recommend class, I would say, drink more water. I won't say eat more chicken. I'll most definitely, class, say drink more water. The third and final bond class is known as the hydrogen bond. So typical of which class is the hydrogen bond, and I'm just drawing things I would say here you know about. So yes, it's a water molecule. And... And here, let's draw this one. I guess I'll say there. Boom. So what I've drawn here is, I guess I'll draw another. Let's draw one here. There. And then let me draw that. There. Boom. So here in this square, and then I'll say here in that square, and I would draw another, but I don't want to make this get too, too hard to see. But what I've drawn for you, class, is that hydrogen bond that forms class between that partial, I repeat, that partial negative charge, I repeat, between that partial negative charge as indicated here and as indicated there, and of course, the hydrogen atom that's covalently bonded class to an oxygen or nitrogen. So that's where you find it. So I would say this is what makes water molecules class stick to other water molecules. For instance, there's a water molecule here stuck to that water molecule class that is there. And it's all because of those hydrogen bonds that exist. Up next class are redox reactions. So the redox reaction, I'll just be blunt class. This occurs by way of electron transfer. So it's with energy transfer. So the way it happens, class, is by way of oxidation and reduction, and they always occur together. So as oxidation occurs, class, it's nothing more than that loss of an electron. It could be, of course, more than just one electron. And as reduction occurs, it's going to be, of course, the gain of electron or the gain of more than one electron. They always occur together, class, and I like to think of them, class, being, of course, not just electron transfer, but also energy transfer. So if something, class, is, is getting oxidized, meaning that oxidizing agent is that that's going to accept or gain the electron. 
And of course, the reducing agent is what's giving up the electron. So as I've said it this way, just keep in mind that they occur at the same time, reduction class as well as oxidation. And to think of it this way class, in our cells, it's oxidation, typical of which, that will involve the removal class of the hydrogen atom from a covalent bond. And then when, when reduction occurs, it typically involves class that, of course, gain of that hydrogen atom. So let's finish things up last year with water. Water class is a must, meaning without water class, we couldn't live. It makes a class well over half of our body weight. I think about myself, and, and I'm not perfect, far from it, but I jumped on the scale just this morning. Why? I have no clue. Let me stop weighing myself. I'm weighing water. So by way of photosynthesis class, what happens is, is that source of oxygen class in the air, as well as class the hydrogen atoms, are used in many, many molecules. So I'm saying this because we must have water. And without water class, well, I'll just put it this way, photosynthesis class, it just would not be occurring. So it's a major solvent class for rac reactions, meaning some reactions will not occur unless, of course, there is an addition of water and other reactions class occur and, of course, I guess you say give off water. So let's continue on. Water molecules, as I mentioned earlier, class are polar. It's a polar covalent. And I'll just keep on going because, of course, we know now that it's the hydrogen bond class that, of course, bonds those water molecules together that allow them, of course, to stick together. So it's cohesion, meaning it allows water molecules to stick to other water molecules, giving water its cohesive properties, allowing water class to move up. Let's, I'll say again, allowing water molecules to move up in the plant by way of the xylem type of tissue. And then, of course, it's adhesion. And as adhesion occurs, this is what allows water molecules to stick to other substances, such as the water sticking on my windshield as it rained this morning, or such as a dew class on your vehicle, or the dew class on the leaves of that plant in the morning. And I hope you love the dew class in the morning. But this class is what makes wet things wet, such as anything that's wet. So capillary action class is what allows water to, I guess I'll say, go against gravity and, of course, move in that upward direction. So it uses class both adhesion as well as cohesion. And then the surface tension, I guess I'd rather show you that class than just tell you. But surface tension, as you can now see it, their class it occurs when those molecules at the surface of water, they crowd together. With that, and they make that strong layer, and it's those cohesive properties of water that, of course, is beneath it that allow class the, of course, insects, such as, if you look really, really closely, class, look as they can rest on the surface of the water. So that's what you're seeing here, class, with this water strider. Yes, a water strider, striding water. So with this, meaning being that water molecules are polar and that water can dissolve many types of substances, keep in mind, other things class are excluded. So yes, hydrophilic or water-loving substances class can interact well with water. Those hydrophobic substances class are not water-soluble. And we'll get to solubility class a bit later on, not in today's lecture. So it just keeps things, I guess I'll say, as they ought to be class biologically. And this is especially important class within the human body. So from here, I'll keep on moving class to the states. Water class exists here on Earth as, of course, a gas, a liquid, and a solid class, or at least that crystalline structure being ice, being less dense as a solid, or at least that crystalline, as opposed to it being classed the liquid. So water class has a high specific heat, and of course, the temperature, so that average kinetic energy of those particles. It takes a lot of energy because it has a high heat evaporation class, and that's that amount of heat class required to change just one gram of that substance class to, of course, that vapor phase. It's, it's I say, utterly uh, amazing. So the next I'll get to, of course, is its evaporative cooling effect. Like one time, I sweat. When you sweat class, 
you're sweating because of course that increase in body temperature. So this is happening class to ensure you of course can get rid of that excess heat to ensure you stay at homeostasis, to ensure, to ensure class that your body temperature does not change class so drastically or even so quickly. So some molecules move faster than others and they are more likely class to evaporate, taking that heat away from the body. So with that class, I'm moving on because I've already got to its high specific heat, you will. And moving on to acids and bases. So to help you with that class, think of the acid being class a substance that dissociates in a solution to yield hydrogen ions and anion. So in another way to see it class, acids as they are, they dissociate in the, the dissociation in that solution that occurs class yield hydrogen ions. So I guess you say one way to say it class is that acids have a higher hydrogen ion concentration than hydroxide ion concentration. I'll say again, acids have a higher hydrogen ion concentration class than hydroxide concentration. In other words, I would think you would say this top right hand side of your screen has a lot more hydrogen ions than hydroxide ions. Next up, a base. So a base is a substance that dissociates in a solution to yield hydroxide ions and a cation. So they are proton acceptors, they being, of course, bases. For instance, I'll go on opposites. A base class has a greater hydroxide ion concentration than hydrogen ion concentration. So I, I'm quite sure you see at the bottom half of the screen, I guess I should draw a line to make sure it's a, a line of demarcation. So there are class a lot more hydroxide ions at the bottom of the screen than there are hydrogen ions. And that is the essence class of acids and bases. So I'll just go ahead and pair it with this class pH. I know you've heard of it before, but there we go. Think of pH class, and I forgot to mention where I am in the textbook. I'm sorry, you all. Let me turn back just a moment ago. In your textbook class, I am now here on page 41. I am now here, class, on page 41. Section 2.6. So think of pH class as being that hydrogen ion power. I repeat, pH, it, it provides us, class, with a solution's acidity. And as you think of it that way, you can, you can look at, class, the difference in the number of hydrogen ions class at the top right hand side of the screen compared to the number of hydrogen ions at the bottom of the screen. So when I say it that way, it's pH that's going to be used. And as it happens, it's going to be used on a logarithmic scale. And just because I've said a logarithmic scale that does not, I repeat, just because I've said a log logarithmic scale, it doesn't mean, class, that this is something you all cannot do. So let me continue on from here, and I'll get right back to that. So some bases do not dissociate to yield hydroxide ions directly, such as ammonia that acts as a base by accepting proton from water and then producing class an ammonium ion and, and then releasing class the hydroxide ion. So it's not directly, but in this case, class, it's indirectly. So back to where I was with pH. So now that I've got the pH class, if you look closely, it says it's a negative logarithm. It's at log base 10. And it's all about that hydrogen ion concentration. So here, class, it is expressed in moles per liter. So with that, it states that the negative logarithm corresponds to a positive pH value. So of course, pH is seven. I was gonna do a bit more with this, but let's just talk for just a few moments. So as I talk for a few moments here, I'll go through 
some common things I know you know about. For instance, I'll begin with distilled water. Distilled water class has a pH of 7. However, if you go down to tomato juice, tomato juice class has a pH of 4.2. So let me write 4.2 tomato juice. For the converse, I'll go on over to an egg white. An egg white has a pH of that approximate, excuse me, of that approximate 8. So I hope you can see that those are pretty distinct opposites. And let's go to in the body itself. You, you have a body and I have a body too. So we have gastric juices within the body. And the pH of the gastric juices class is 2. Compare it to class. The pH of ammonia. The pH ammonia class is 11.5. Having now done this, I did all of this to get to that. Solutions class with a pH, I repeat, solutions class with a pH that is 7 are stated to be neutral. And if you don't know what I mean, I mean that right now. Neutral solutions class, when these solutions have a pH that is neutral, have an equal concentration of both hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. In other words, this equals that as far as class, the concentration. So an acidic solution class has a pH that is less than 7. And that means, class, that they have a greater hydrogen ion concentration than hydroxide ion concentration. And I've given you that already. And the opposite class is the case for basic solutions having a pH class that is greater than 7. That means, of course, that the hydroxide ion concentration is, of course, greater than the hydrogen ion concentration. So back to where I was just moments ago, class, and we're now at buffer systems. So a buffer serves class to resist change in pH. And I'll leave it at just that. So this happens because, of course, the buffer includes a weak acid or even a weak base. So our blood, meaning your blood and my blood class, at homeostasis, meaning when things are normal, it has a pH class between 7.35 and 7.45. That's where we are at homeostasis. Yes, it's just that narrow class, the limits. So in the body, what happens is we have this carbonic acid. I repeat, in our body class, we have this bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system. So if you look closely, it says in the blood, carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid, that weak acid. And keep in mind that this weak acid class dissociates to yield hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. For instance, in the event class, I repeat, in the event class that we have excess hydrogen ions, let's just say you went into diabetic ketoacidosis it would, of course, shift the system to the left, meaning the hydrogen ions would then combine with bicarbonate ions to, of course, form carbonic acid. This isn't good. And the very same way class, if we had, of course, too many hydroxide ions, it would shift the system class to the right. And in that shift class, of course, just make sure you keep in mind that this is what keeps us alive. And if you don't really understand what I'm stating, what I'm saying is, is it's by this system that the shift class would occur to either produce more this, more carbonic acid in the case class that your blood pH was too basic or too alkaline, or a class it would be this in the case that the blood class had gotten class to be too acidic. Keep these things in mind, especially those of you who are going into a field such as nursing or at least anything in medicine. So, as it states, class, when an acid and a base are mixed in water, we, hit, we get anions from that acid and cations from the base. 
and they combine plaster with salt. So as salts are formed, class, just keep in mind that that salt is that compound in which the hydrogen ion class of that acid is replaced class by some other cation. So sodium chloride class is a salt with that hydrogen ion of the hydrochloric acid or HCl has been replaced class by the cation sodium. So there we have it. So now we've gotten that far, keep in mind, class, that when a salt, acid, or base is dissolved in water, its electrolytes class can conduct an electric current. So this class is why it's so important that we have the appropriate fluid balance of acids and bases within the body. And this is how, of course, I would say everything class in the body occurs. So with this, what I'll nextly say, class, is to make sure you've taken notes on this lecture and study quite well. This has been your instructor, Skylar Huff, and from here we'll move on into Chapter 3 in our next lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, class, call me at my office telephone number, or just stop by.